The brain is the most complicated structure in the known universe. And of all the things that the brain does, memory is the most important. All animals have memory. Even little tiny worms have memory. And their memory is much like ours. Now imagine what it would be like to not have memory. You wouldn't be able to live but for a fraction of time. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't be here because your ancestors, who also wouldn't be here, would have to have remembered where the food was, where the water was, how to mate, and how to get along in life, because memory is absolutely essential to everything that we do. It's critical to our existence and to our survival. Now, we have a lot of experiences all the time. Uh, you may experience, for example, a little pressure on your right elbow. Is that important? Well, it's not important now. But suppose um, a lion came up and bit you on your left elbow at this time, you'd be inclined to remember that. So whether or not you remember it depends upon what happens to the experience and how significant it is. And all memories are not equally important. They differ in, in their importance. Philosophers have for centuries wondered why it is that despite all of the experiences that we have during the day, day after day after day, we remember so little. That is, if you think about it, what do you remember about a week ago last Thursday? You had a lot of experiences, and at the time that you had them, you remembered them vividly. And now most of them are gone. So what is that all about? That's what we have tried to figure out in my laboratory for the last several decades. Now, we got some early clues about this from studies of what is called retrograde amnesia that were done in the 1940s. What was discovered was that in both animals, laboratory animals, and in human subjects, that if they were given an electroconvulsive shock treatment, that is electricity applied to the head, that they would selectively forget things that they had just learned. So last in is the first gone. Memories that were a little bit older were preserved. This effect, which was retrograde, meaning that the biggest effect was shortly after the experience, was called retrograde amnesia. And this shows the effect, if you look at the red line, if an experience is followed immediately after such a treatment and then tested later on, the memory is very poor. But if the treatment was given at a long time after the experience, then the memory is intact. And this graded effect is called the gradient of retrograde amnesia. Now, years ago, I learned about the retrograde uh, amnesia phenomenon. And at that time, I was studying the effects of stimulant drugs on memory. I was giving stimulant drugs to animals, putting them in a maze, rats and mice, and finding that if I gave them the drug shortly before they learned each day, that they perform better the next day. And it looked as though I was influencing the animal's memory. But I didn't know. So I discovered retrograde amnesia findings, and I said, let me apply that to this kind of learning in which I'm giving a drug. And I decided to give the drug after learning rather than before learning. And the question was, would I be able to influence memory by giving the drug after learning? And I did in a number of experiments using stimulant drugs, and that's shown on the top curve. I gave stimulant drugs to animals shortly after they were trained, and they had better memory. If I gave the same drug to them at a later time after memory, it had no effect at all. So here we had, at that time then, retrograde amnesia and retrograde enhancement of memory. Now, here's the important question for today, and that is, why do memories consolidate, become fixed slowly? See, we know that they do because we can prevent their formation for minutes and hours after learning occurs, but not at a later time, or we can enhance memory if we give stimulant drugs shortly after learning, but not at a later time. So what, is, what, what allows that? What is it about the brain that enables that to happen? Well, we thought a lot about it. We had some bad ideas, because science is full of bad ideas, and then we had a good idea. And although we didn't get this idea uh, from Francis Bacon, who said it in 1620, we only discovered it later, 
we had the same idea, which we thought was original, and it turns out it was not original at all. Memory is assisted by anything that makes a, an impression on a powerful passion, inspiring fear, for example, joy, wonder, shame, or, or joy. 1620. Memory is enhanced by anything that is exciting. That's what he said in 1620. Now, what, is, what happens when things are exciting? Well, we already knew that. If we are excited about something, we release to ourselves stress hormones. We release on the left side over here, when the brain is activated through this pathway, we release cortisol in humans or corticosterone in rats and mice. On this side, we release through this pathway epinephrine or what we all know as adrenaline. That happens. And that happens whether you want it to or not. There is nothing that you can do about it. If I were to insult you right now, if I were to praise you, if you were to get a bite on your left elbow, these events would happen. And there's nothing you can do about it. This is automatic. So we said, when we train animals, this is likely to happen. And maybe what we did with our stimulant drugs was to enhance the release of these substances. And maybe we could do something without the drugs or without electroconvulsive shock to show that this is the effect. So here was the first experiment ever on this problem, which was done in my laboratory a number of years ago. Animals were trained in this apparatus, which is nothing but a straight alley. Rats are put in here one at a time. They could walk down to the middle of the alley where they received a mild electric shock, a single event. For the memory test the next day, they were put in the starting region of this alley and asked, would you like to go back to the place where you received the shock? And the answer is, if it was a low shock, they didn't mind going back. If it was a high shock, they stayed away from it. So we could use the latency of re-entry as a measure of the retention of this experience. So here's the results of the first experiment. The white bar shows the performance of animals that received a saline injection immediately after that single training experience. But if they received adrenaline or epinephrine immediately after the training, this is what happened. Very, very significant increase in the animal's unwillingness to go back where they had had that foot shock. Now, retrograde amnesia said that the effect should decrease with time, and that's exactly what happened. If the injection was delayed a little while, it was less effective, delayed a little bit more, less effective, and delayed by two hours, no effect at all. So this is the first study of retrograde enhancement of memory via a hormone that we all have in us. This is not artificial. This is a hormone that you and I release when we get excited about something. Now, we know from lots of experiments, including many that we did, that there's a region of the brain that also gets excited by emotional arousal, and that region is the amygdala, which is pointed out here in yellow. It's a region which is in the middle part of the brain, deep within the temporal region of the brain. Anything that excites us excites the amygdala, and we reasoned that the amygdala probably gets excited by the release of epinephrine. So, we're gonna take a look at this, and we ask the, the question, when animals are excited, do they release norepinephrine within the amygdala? Norepinephrine is an excitatory neurotransmitter which is in the brain, and we know that it is turned on by the, by the release of epinephrine in the system because we have studied that. But the question is, does it specifically activate the amygdala? So here's the result. The animals were sitting in a box, and you can see the release of norepinephrine, this is baseline. And then at this point, they were trained in that little task that I showed you. They were put in the box and allowed to go through and get the shock. And what is measured here is the release of norepinephrine within the basal lateral amygdala that was induced by that training experience. So you can see in some cases, it is a huge increase, 600 to 700%, and in some animals, hardly at all. So we ask the question then, is there any relationship between the amount of norepinephrine that is released in this region of the amygdala and later memory? 
And the answer is yes. If you look at this animal that released a huge amount of norepinephrine in this region of the brain, that animal never went back to the alley where it got a shock. This animal down here that released hardly any norepinephrine in the amygdala went right through within 10 seconds. And what you see in these numbers here is a very nice relationship between the amount of norepinephrine that is released in this region of the brain and the performance, the memory performance of these animals the next day. And if I were asked what measure would I like best in order to predict memory, I would say I'll take this one because this is one of the best predictors we have. I'll show you another one in a minute. Now, we have um, uh, examined the involvement of this substance, this neurochemical that's released in the basolateral amygdala. We've examined its effects in a lot of different tasks, and the thing I want to tell you is that the amygdala does not care what it has learned. It is promiscuous with respect to the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine in the amygdala. So I'm going to show you one experiment here. A rat is put into a box with two objects that are identical, in this case, uh, light bulbs. The next day, it's tested with two different objects. And the question is, on the second day, which object does the animal choose to explore? And the answer is that the animal chooses to explore this object. And we can reason that the reason that it does is because it remembers having seen the previous one on the preceding day. This is called novel object memory, novel object recognition memory. So we use that. So here's the experiment. Over here, you see the effects of norepinephrine in different doses on memory, or up is strong memory. This is the enhancing effect of norepinephrine administered into this region of the brain immediately after training. And this is the impairing effect of administration of a blocker of norepinephrine put in immediately after training. So here we have enhancement. It's dose response. The higher dose doesn't work. But here we have the impairment. So we can say that noradrenergic modulation in this region of the brain regulates the memory strength that we assess the next day. Now, we haven't done too many experiments uh, with humans, uh, maybe half a dozen, but the experiments that we have done have given us exactly the same results. And I'll just show you one of those experiments. This is one in which we use positron emission tomography, or PET imaging, to study the effect of emotional arousal on memory and human subjects. So what we did was to show human subjects a series of emotionally arousing film clips just after they were injected with radio-labeled glucose so that we could find out where the glucose was through positron emission tomography half hour later. So a half hour later, after the, after the subject were injected and after they watched the films, we assessed amygdala activity with positron emission tomography. And you're looking at the results of the movies that they saw tested three weeks later. And here's what you see. This is the positon measurement right here, the right amygdala glucose. And this is the number of films recalled several weeks later. And these are individual subjects. And what you see is a correlation of plus 0.93, an almost perfect relationship between activation of the amygdala and subsequent memory. We've also found in other experiments that when we administer epinephrine, uh, to human subjects they remember better, or if we give them treatments that cause them to release epinephrine, they remember better. Now we've also looked at the other stress hormone, uh, cortisone, and the re results are the same. Uh, they, um, as you can see, it involves activation of this region of the brain, and interestingly, it requires noradrenergic activation. That is, cortisone doesn't do the job by itself, but it requires the activation of the adrenergic system in parallel with it, parallel with it in order to do the job. Now here is a, a cartoon summary of uh, what we have found with these experiments over the years. First of all, 
we have a learning experience, we have a number of brain regions over here which are the likely areas in which memories are processed. So that's the beginning of it. Secondly, when we have a learning experience, these regions get activated a little bit. So we, we learn something here, the cortex get activated, the hippocampus, the caudate, lots of other brain regions, also the basal lateral amygdala, and also the adrenal gland. That's the first stage of this. Already there's some learning occurring, but now we're gonna see some enhancement of that learning that's provided by the modulatory influences that come from the adrenal gland through glucocorticoids, through activation with epinephrine, releasing norepinephrine, which it then goes to these other brain regions so that you have this double modulating influences and these are the things that regulate the strength of the memory of that experience. Now if we go back, that would be a little bit of memory. All experiences are remembered a little bit. As a matter of fact, we have to assume that almost every experience is remembered a little bit. If that were not the case, repetition wouldn't work. Repetition works because every experience you have leaves a little bit of a trace. But that little experience can be turned into a big memory through these modulatory influences. Now, a long time ago, another writer, uh, Descartes, wrote that the usefulness of all of the passions persists in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul thoughts which are good for it to conserve. The usefulness of the passions. It's very much like the first quote that I showed you, but it's from a different person. It says, the usefulness is to help us determine which of these many experiences we have are the ones that we ought to retain. And it's the automatic action of the system that does selection. You don't need to see, say, the tiger bit me on the arm when I was sitting in the chair. I have to remember that. If a tiger bit you on the arm in the chair where you're sitting, believe me, you would remember that. And the, the kind of events that I just talked about here play a major role in your memory. Now, your memories are not uniquely designed to deal with tigers. It's designed to deal with all of the other things that happen to us throughout life. If somebody whispers to you in your ear at the right time and the right place, I love you, that can be as powerful as the tiger biting you on the arm. And I would say that too would be a good thing to remember. Thank you.